Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. Tonight, my name is Tim. I'll be uh, introducing until Brahm is finished uh, collecting money. For those of you who do not know about the college, it's been around since 1951. The format of the college is as follows. We start off with a brief announcements period. We then move into our speaker who then speaks for up to an hour. We then have a question and answer period where there are supposed to be questions and not commentary. After the uh, question and answer period, we have the infamous rebuttal period where you can speak on any subject given, including or whether or not it pertains to the speaker or not. And uh, now, some of us may have come here under the illusion that we'll be hearing about North Korea. Uh, that's from Stanfield Smith, who's uh, recently returned from uh, North Korea. Uh, and I do believe he is here and willing to speak and even to respond to your questions. Right. Very Inviting me to come here and speak. Um, I went. Um, I went to North Korea kind of by accident. Or Democratic People's Republic of Korea, as the official name of North Korea is. I went. Uh, I was going on a family vacation. And I was going to choose with my family whether to go to uh, Italy or China, and China was cheaper, so we went there. Since all the tours to North Korea leave from Beijing. I thought I'd go early and go see North Korea, otherwise I wasn't going to go there just to go see North Korea. And when I was there, after talking to North Koreans, I was so surprised about what a different point of view and understanding of their history and what's going on in the Korea Peninsula from what we hear here in our newspapers that I, after talking to them for some time, I thought, well, this is my friends back in Chicago and other places would probably want to know what they think because they probably don't know any more than I do so I started writing it down and asked them to interview them and I did and then I it got in the counterpunch and information clearinghouse and then I wrote another article too about um, the US war threats which I must say it's kind of a shock to go from there seeing what's on their news to come back here about wonder what are Americans in the media and the president talking about about North Korea wants to go to war with the US it's just totally bizarre um, I have a lot of stuff to cover I don't know if I can do it in an hour so I'll just try to rush through it as as see what how much I can get through in an hour um, but I must say after I published those two things I got a lot of responses from a rather surprised me from all over, from China, newspapers in China, the New Zealand. I just got another one from a newspaper in China. I got interviewed with a KPFK, I think, in California. And even uh, RTTV did an interview with me yesterday for five minutes, which, interestingly enough, was the only uh, foreign language channel I could get on the TV in Pyongyang. <laughs> um, now the defining thing for uh, Korea is like, for us the Korean War is something that's ancient history and it's not relevant to anything going on today in the world. But people in Korea, the Korean War is as real to them as the Nakba is to Palestinians. That's when the Palestinians lost their land in 1947, and they've been trying to get the right to some of their land back. So that's a defining moment in their lives. So to really understand the situation there, we have to go back and look at, well, what led up to the war and division of Korea. So in 1945, the, the, the leaders in North Korea, historic ones, and a lot of them have died now, had been fighting a guerrilla war against the Japanese since uh, J Japan occupied North Korea, Korea in 1910. So they've been fighting against the Japanese since the early 1930s. And this, so this had been going on and finally towards the end they had uh, influence in, in Manchuria and in the northern part of Korea. 
So when the war ended, they were the one organized Korean force there. But the U.S. went and um, arbitrarily drew a line in the middle of Korea. Dean Russ did, I think, sat down at a desk in Washington, drew a line in Korea and said, Soviet Union go up to this point and we're going to go up to the other point. And the agreement was that 1948, both armies would withdraw and there'd be national elections in Korea. But then the U.S. figured that they're pre the people that they supported in the South were not going to win this national election, so they canceled that. And they just stayed in the, in the southern half of Korea and made it permanent. Now, the leaders in South Korea that the U.S. was working with were all Japanese uh, collaborators. They were all officials in the Japanese army or in the Japanese structure running in Korea. Which is one reason why they were extremely unpopular and they wouldn't have won any democratic election in Korea. Now, since it's also said um, that North Korea is looking for war with the United States, which is rather ridiculous, um, North Korea has always proposed for the last 60 years that they want a peace treaty to end the, the Korean War. There is no peace treaty. There's just an armistice between United States, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, and China. And the South Korea is not any signer of this armistice. It's just these three countries. They want a permanent peace treaty. They want to have their country reunited. And they've made different proposals that there be one national government that's in charge of diplomacy and um, foreign affairs and diplomacy, and that the two local governments are in charge of everything else, and then over a period, a long period of time, they can slowly reunite into one country again. And they also want the U.S. and South Korea to discontinue their annual war games, as they call them, their war maneuvers against North Korea that go on every year in which the U.S. uses practices using nuclear weapons. Now, the U.S. has always refused to, uh, to do any of this. They refuse to talk to North Korea, which is what the present leader wants. As you might remember, when Dennis Rodman went there and then came back, he was ridiculed, but what he said was the message from the leader of North Korea was that, let's talk, we don't want war. That was the message from North Korea. The U.S. just ridiculed that and escalated the military situation. And you read in this country about what North Korea is doing, but you don't read about how the U.S. is provoking them. They just, the U.S. is provoking North Korea into doing something, and they don't put that in the newspaper, just hear the North Korean response. And I didn't really know that so much till I was there, and they went over what the U.S. had been doing since the beginning of March. But let me go back a little bit over some of the first over some of the social gains that have been made in the in the north. So that everyone there has a right to a home, they have right to free health care, they have a right to a job, and they have compulsory education through grade eleven. Hey, in the north. Well, okay, you can take it up later if you want. Um, North, the North Korea was more economically developed than the South up through the 1980s, or the early 1980s. It probably had one of the highest rates of economic growth in the 50s or 60s of any country in the world. Even in the CIA, it estimated in 1972, their economic growth was 35% a year. Um, they've also made uh, radical improvements in the position of women, so Nowadays, there are more women graduates from university than men. So even the internal CIA study acknowledges various achievements of the North, such as compassionate care for war orphans in particular and children in general, a radical change in the position of women, genuinely free housing, high standard preventive medicine on a national scale, Infant mortality and life expectancy rates 
comparable to most advanced countries until the 1990s famine hit. So, but since the 1990s and the last 15 years, their, their economy has been in a pretty bad situation. In fact, the, the CIA has even admitted that the vast majority of North Koreans do in fact revere Kim Il-sung, whose statues and pictures are everywhere there. Now, I was there, I noticed that you don't see any advertising, you don't see any noisy city, any places in cities. There's no neon lights, there's no graffiti, there's no gangs. It's, it's a very well-organized, orderly society. Uh, so the little comparison between the North and the South, the population in the North is 24 and a half million and the South is 49 million. And there are 10 million Koreans living abroad. The literacy rate in the North is 99% and 97% in the South. The underweight children in the North is 20% as of 2004. Life expectancy in the North is 70 years and life expectancy in the South is 79 years. Infant mortality now in the North is 19 per thousand and in the South it's the CIA thing says four per thousand, but that would be less than the United States. Um, something that it comes up about nuclear weapons, uh, well, I'll get into what one of the people told me there, but um, the U.S. has more than 8,000 nuclear weapons, a quarter of which are activated. Russia has about 10,000. France has 330. China has 240, Britain has 225, Pakistan, India, and Israel have not signed a non-proliferation treaty, have about 100 nuclear weapons each. So it's estimated there's a total of more than 18,000 nuclear weapons in the world, and North Korea has three or four of them. <clears throat> but nevertheless, they are singled out for having weapons. As a, well, one of them told me when I was there that there have been 2,000 nuclear bomb tests in the world. North Korea has had three of them. There's also been 9,000 missile launches in, in, in the world. North Korea has made four. The United Nations hasn't sanctioned any country in the world except for North Korea. It's also that South Korea has also admitted in 2005 that they had been developing or enriching uranium to make a nuclear bomb. And they had been doing that for 20 years. But they are not, uh, they are not sanctioned for that. They never were sanctioned for that. They, South Korea sent off a missile this year in January, if any of you remember that. You can all remember North Korea sent off a missile, but South did the same thing and nothing happened. So one thing that really gets North Koreans angry is this double standard that's applied to them that is not applied to South Korea or any other country. And also, North Korea is the only country there that calls for a nuclear-free Korea, and the United States and South Korea won't discuss it. Now, the, the book that I read that I found pretty informative about North Korea is this book called North Korea, Another Country which is by Bruce Cummings, who's a University of Chicago professor. And he, he also wrote one called On the Korean War. Now he's, a, he's not any particular, maybe he's just a, a liberal, but he's an honest historian. And so he just reports honestly. And I think he's more incensed about the disinformation in this country than he is anything coming out of North Korea. He said in his book that the U.S. press reports on North Korea are, quote, as uninformative, unreliable, and often sens sensationalized, and are deceiving and not educational, which I think is true. Especially now, you might wonder, I think one reason why the U.S. is hyping up this <coughs> stuff about North Korea wanting to go to war is that 
the U.S. government is planning to cut our Social Security and Medicare, and they don't want you to be reading about that every day in the newspaper. They want you to read about something else you should be scared of, not that real thing you should be scared of. So they make up this North Korean boogeyman to distract people while they are going to do this. Bruce Cummings in his book says, well, why is North Korea, he says, why is it a garrison state? Primarily because of the Holocaust that the North experienced during the Korean War. And that Holocaust was inflicted upon Korea by the United States. The war started, I don't know, I mean, it depends if it doesn't really start on July 25th, 1950, who started it, the North or the South, I think. You can make a pretty good argument that one or the other started it, but it really started because the United States divided this country. I mean, some other country goes in and divides a line in our country. There is no reason why any of us would respect it. And we would all want to fight to reunite the country. But in the course of the Korean War, four, <clears throat> four million Koreans got killed by the, in the U.S. war there. North Korea was more bombed than uh, Japan was. It suffered more casualties than Japan and the United States in World War II. Their cities were more destroyed than Japanese cities were. In fact, they had this stop bombing and towards the end of the war because they, they said there was nothing else to bomb. Everything had been bombed and destroyed. I remember I used to be a uh, teach English second language and about 15 years ago, I had one old Chinese woman who had been a singer in the Korean ar in the Japanese in the Chinese army during the Korean War, and she said when she went around the North singing to the Chinese soldiers, there was no buildings to have any of these things in. They all had to be outside because everything had been destroyed. And even to sign the armistice, they had to make a special building to sign the armistice because there was no building they could go into. Now even uh, Curtis LeMay was one of the leaders of the U.S. Air War, if you know him, famous guy who ran George Wallace's running mate. He said in 1995 in the New Yorker that over a period of three years or so, we killed off what? 20% of the population. I mean that is a rate of killing that is a greater rate of killing than the Nazis did in the Soviet Union or in Poland. <coughs> Even in Poland, that was the country that suffered the most in World War II in the Europe. That was only 10% of the population. Now, the Korean, the, the Korean War really started before there was a civil war in South Korea even before 1950. The South Korean government had killed over 200,000 political opponents even before the war started. Um, then after let me, I could quote you something from General MacArthur, if I could find it. Oh, <clears throat> said so he had given orders that after the Chinese had entered the war, that any, any man-built structures are military targets, and that use all North, treat all North Korean cities and villages as in scorched earth ta tactics. It was, it was uh, fair targets to kill North or South Koreans, for they might be future communists. So PA, the POWs and nurses were executed and gunned down. Entire, entire villages were marked as, as communists and executed. And POWs and nurses were hung naked and tortured in police stations. So an American Marine chaplain described the South Korean officers forcing some 100 alleged collaborators, including children, pregnant women, and old men, to dig their own graves before being massacred. 
the chaplain said this kind of thing happened all over the front. And even uh, General MacArthur in a report to Congress said, the war in Korea has almost destroyed that nation. I've never seen such devastation. I have seen, I guess, as much blood and disaster as any living man, but it just curled my stomach the last time I was there. After I looked at that wreckage and those thousands of women and children and everything, I vomited. If you go on definitely, you're perpetu perpetuating a slaughter that such as I've never heard of in the history of mankind. And when was, I think MacArthur was removed in 1951. It was one year into the war. He was uh, not really removed because he wanted to drop uh, 40 to 60 nuclear bombs along the North Korean-Chinese border, but there was the U.S. government discussed using nuclear bombs in North in Korea two, two weeks after the war started. The, the issue was who was going to be deciding who was going to, uh, if the bombs were going to be used or not. So this is the history that uh, Koreans who live in, who grow up, this is their history. This is not something that's now we can forget about it and not know about it. And I didn't know really about this until I started reading the, about Korea before I was going to go. But to them, they know about it, and for them, it's real. And for them, you know, the people who did this 60 years ago, they're still right there on the other side of the border. They're still threatening them. And they know if there's a war that this kind of thing could happen again. So they are not, I don't think, paranoid to... Uh, you were very worried about what the U.S. is doing. Because the U.S. can say what it does in the press now because we don't really know what happened before. Um, now I want to get into uh, how U.S. is used uh, as food as a weapon against North Korea. Um, they admit that, it, that famine has caused over 200,000 deaths. But even people who have said that uh, there's a lot of starvation in North Korea say that it's nothing like there is in India that happens every year, day in, day out. And I must say, being there, I've been to India. India is a qualitatively worse situation. It's, I don't know if any of you have been there, the, the misery of the poor people and the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of homeless children that you'll see who never have a hot meal or never sleep in a bed or and they never go to school it's, it's pretty shocking North Korea is not anywhere near like that um, I said that the US has given North Korea food aid sometimes in the 90s and sometimes in the year 2000s, but as of last year in April, the U.S. has stopped getting food aid again. That was because North Korea launched a missile, a, a non-military satellite in March 2012, which was a weather satellite. Now the U.S. has launched, what, I think five or seven military satellites last year, or missiles. And then only, uh, no, no one says anything about the U.S. doing that, but if North Korea launches a, a weather satellite, they are sanctioned with uh, um, food sanctions and other sanctions on that country. And the food sanctions, it really only hurts the children. They're the ones who suffer the most. Even in U.N. reports, they say that it is the children who suffer the most from sanctions who they have nothing to do with the situation as you know just like if our our government was in conflict with some other country we wouldn't really have much say so about what's going on so if we have to suffer from it i mean we didn't really do anything it's the government that that is doing it but nevertheless, sanctions do not really hurt the people who are in charge. The sanctions hurt the average person, and in particular children. And the U.S. knows that. 
Uh, right now, I think North Korea needs $100 million in aid. The UN requests that North Korea needs $100 million in, in uh, food aid to meet their food needs for the year, which is not much money. I remember, I don't know how much these war maneuvers that the U.S. spent in, how much they spent in March, but I know for those two be two bombers, I think, to leave from Missouri and fly to Korea and drop dummy uh, atomic bombs and fly back to Missouri. That cost five and a half million dollars, just that one flight. <laughs> North Korea, is, they need a hundred million dollars. and I'm sure the military war games that are going on in, in right now, the U.S. is doing, cost much more than that, and they could things would alleviate the situation a great deal and end any kind of war conflict if the U.S. just spent that money trying to feed the people in North Korea. Then there wouldn't be any real issue of war. Plus, I should also remember that I had read several times last year that the richest hundred, hundred people in the world made a $240 billion 241 billion dollars last year and if you want to eliminate world poverty all over the planet you would need 60 billion so if you just left these people with 180 billion to spend for 100 people you could eliminate poverty on the planet earth so we might say well what kind of system and what kind of government is crazy? What they have over there or the kind of system that lets that kind of situation go on? I guess... I we're getting out. Oh, no. yell at me. I might say also about there's also not mentioned in the press here is how repressive this government in South Korea is. I don't know if you know there was a, for example, there was an uprising in South Korea in 1981, the Kwanju uprising, that would be similar to, I guess, Tiananmen or Tetlas. Lebko, however it's pronounced, in Mexico in 1968. And I once had a student who was a protester in those protests in Kwanju. He was from South Kwanju, South Korea. He, he was arrested and spent nine months in prison and was tortured. And his family, father finally paid a bribe and got him out of prison and out of the country. I was, in one of these books I was reading that there was a military government in South Korea then the military is under control of the U.S. military in South Korea. And the military went in to Kwanju to put down the uprising. And one thing they did was to use flamethrowers on the protesters. That's what kind of government they had there. And that had to have U.S. approval to do that kind of thing. There's also now, I think... Um, There's a national security law that you cannot, um, in South Korea, that you cannot... Uh, I don't think they have access to North Korean news sites. They cannot say things that are supportive of the North Korean government, because it's, it's a law that's called supporting an anti-state entity. They can be jailed for it. There's some things I was reading in, in uh, Amnesty International about it, some cases where they're trying to get some of these out of prison who were, one of them was just making fun of the North Korean leader by, by uh, tweeting some of his quotes and for that he was arrested and it was in prison. Now I guess I could get... I could also say there are some things if you want to see on, the, I was watched a lot of things on YouTube and see what life is like in North Korea. And there are some pretty good things on YouTube about North Korea. 
One is called North Korea, A Day in the Life. Another one is called Seven Days in North Korea. And there was one from uh, CARE, you know, the, the food, um, uh, it's a CARE International documentary from the 1990s. But you know, a lot of stuff, if you want to watch in, on YouTube about North Korea, is very distorted. Since they know, you know, Americans don't go there. Though I must say, on my tour, what, there were 45 people on my tour. I went out with this group, Choreo Tours. About 10 of them were from the United States, maybe 15 from the Netherlands, and I think about 15 from Australia and New Zealand, and the rest were from Europe. Um, but most Americans haven't gone to North Korea and don't know much about it, and so when you haven't gone somewhere and you don't know much about it, you can be told anything in the newspapers and you can believe it. You know, like we've all seen pictures of these pretty young North Korean w w traffic officers in the middle of the city directing traffic on streets with no cars on it who are in blue uniforms. But probably 80% of those traffic officers I saw there were men. I did see some of those women, but that was, that was not, that was the exception. But you could find some streets that are empty, but a lot of streets are not empty. But I think that's, that's one thing, you know, when you don't have access to information about a foreign country, then the media can tell you anything about it and you don't know. And if they keep repeating it, well, then you believe it. It sticks in your head. Well now, um, I can show you some pictures of my trip. Well, I could also say one thing I was just looking at yesterday was a UN website about North Korea. If you were wanted to find more, it's about their humanitarian aid to North Korea and what's what's the situation is there like in terms of health care and food and and infrastructure, which it's not a very good situation. I could give it to you any later if you want to look at the website to read about it. They're, they're in a pretty bad situation. So up to about 1990, they were pretty well off there. They even were a food exporter up through to about 1990. But then I think what happened with the food situation, where well, the Soviet Union collapsed, and there went all their cheap oil. Oh, that's the last one. Okay. <laughs> Um, no, no, that's the last ones. You have to go to the other file. North Korea pictures. The top. Um, North Korean agriculture was heavily mechanized and they used a lot of fertilizer, chemical fertilizer. When the Soviet Union collapsed, they had no oil for their machinery and they couldn't use chemical fertilizer. So their agriculture just collapsed. The same kind of thing that happened in Cuba. Um, Yeah, but, but I had a list I was going to show, okay. not go through the whole thing. Um, and then combined with that, there was very serious floods in North Korea, and then there was a drought on in the later 90s, and then there, they went from being a food exporter to not having enough uh, the deficit of like... They only produced like one third of the food that they needed. But now it's improved somewhat. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. 
posters that says uh, supposed to be the US leaving and that says Bush in Korea <laughs> uh. now this is when we just got there this was a bunch of uh, kids roller skating and what this is you will see pictures of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il everywhere, all the time, everywhere, all the time. <laughs> I was uh, there for six days and it was like, wow, I have to live like that all the time. But there are a bunch of kids having fun roller skating in the afternoon. These are in Pyongyang. They'd come up to us and smile and we'd wave to them. These are apartment buildings in the, the north in Pyongyang. Remember all these most of these pictures are gonna be in Pyongyang, the capital. And everything you see in these pictures, everything has been built since the Korean War. Yeah. Since there is nothing left. So those are apartment buildings. And if you saw those were those were a bunch of cars waiting at the stop stop sign stop light. Uh, these were a bunch of um, Think people from all different areas of uh, the consumer um, light industry making consumer goods coming for a national conference about how improved the situation of consumer goods in North Korea. <laughs> I think that is now their focus of their, econo uh, their economic plan is to increase agricultural production in the consumer goods in the country. This is the mausoleum where Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il are, which is a huge place. I think that's where Kim Il-sung used to have his offices, and we had to go there and pay our respects. It was very formal. We had to wear a tie and shoes. Yeah, when I was in China, I also went to the Mao mausoleum. It wasn't like that, but this, it was... Very formal, and we went with our group, and they, in, the, in the beginning they had um, awards and prizes and uh, gifts they'd given for other heads of state around the world, and I got distracted looking at the different countries, and I got separated from my group, and I ended up going with a bunch of Koreans, because you have to go in groups, in groups of four you go up. So I was stuck in the, I was in the middle of their group, and they were looking at me like, why was I there? <laughs> and the guards were looking at me, well, why is this guy here like this by himself? <laughs> but they go up and they all bow, and then they walk to a side and then they bow, and then they walk to the other side of the casket and then they bow. It was, it was interesting. It was interesting, a lot of them were a fair number of the women were crying when they were there. So it is, uh, I guess we might think it's sort of somewhat ridiculous, but to them, they take it very seriously, especially Kim Il-sung, because I guess he really did, um, he is a big national hero. Under his rule in North Korea, their country did very well. I think this is a um, 
this is a big uh, area of the city that is a monuments to all the uh, heroes who died fighting the Japanese, which there is about 300 or 400 statues like this. I just took this one because this was Kim Il-sung's uh, younger brother who got killed in 1935. And all the leaders of Korea, North Korea, the generation of Kim Il-sung, all of them had family members who were killed by the Japanese, tortured to death or starved to death. Here is a big group of uh, Koreans who are coming to the same site to pay their respects to all these uh, martyrs from the struggle against the Japanese. And I must say one thing that they also pointed out to me was that I think the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Korea suffered a lot from that. Because the Japanese took a lot of Koreans as slave labor. Besides taking 200,000 Korean women to be prostitutes for the Japanese soldiers. And I think 35,000 Koreans were killed in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. So they know what nuclear war means. Besides the fact that they've been threatened by the U.S. with nuclear bombs several times, several times in the Korean War, with the Pueblo incident in 1969, with the shooting down of a U.S. airplane, and Pueblo incident in 68, shooting down of a spy plane in 69. They've repeatedly been threatened with nuclear war. Here's their subway. A little classier than our subway stops. These are the subway cars. She's very clean there. I don't know. It's the same, I don't know if that's, maybe it's the same subway stop. Because when we were in the car, it didn't come out too well. I guess it's like crowded like a Chicago subway. Not like when I was in Beijing. But I was in Beijing a couple of days before my trip there and a week after. And I was telling somebody here, I went to Beijing in 2005 and they had three subway lines. Now they have 13 and they're building two more. And they have like TVs in their subway cars. It's very fancy. It's, it's kind of amazing. It's like this country, China is like producing and modernizing so rapidly. And this country is just like sitting in the water. It's like five years from now, what's going to be like the U.S. and China? Well, actually, I think another thing about the U.S. The, this talk of war between the U.S. and North Korea is also an excuse to, for the U.S. to militarize all around China and say, it's not directed against you, China. We're defending ourselves from North Korea. China is a big issue to the United States, as you probably know. And they're very worried about China overtaking them. which they are more and more, especially when I go there and you see how much that country is developing compared to here.
Yeah. It also is interesting that the war situation with North Korea kept escalating until the head of state of China made a speech calling for peace and no more, well, I forget how he said it, but it was portrayed in the newspapers here as China was criticizing North Korea, but not by name. If you remember in the papers, maybe about five days ago, but then right after that, the U.S. started saying, okay, we're going to, like, cool it. It's like uh, China was talking to the United States when it said that, but the U.S. was trying to say, no, they really mean North Korea. But then the U.S. started saying, okay, we're not going to launch missiles now, and we're not going to do this. We're not going to send over new bombers. I just took this was in the park where they were road raiding this this is like North and the soldier playing what's it volleyball with some kids there. This is their super size hotel that you might have heard of. There's supposed to be 115 stories. It's not open yet. I don't know if it, when it will be, but... Hmm? It's in Pyongyang. I took pictures. These are all... Everywhere you go where they have any flat land, they're growing food. This is in Pyongyang. Here's a bedroom I was in in one hotel. And I must say, when I was there, there wasn't any heat anywhere. It's like we were in a restaurant. There wasn't any heat. And there might be very dim lights and the water was intermittent so like we went to this hotel it was freeze it snowed when we were there and there wasn't any heat and you go in their room and say well what they turn on the heat for a couple hours and then they'll turn on the water and say well you can take a shower in the morning from 7 30 to 8 30 and the water will be on some hot water and then it's off and like after 10 o'clock at night, the, all the electricity goes out. So the <laughs> U.S. is saying that, yeah, they're going to attack us, right? <laughs> and we were tourists. And these were like, uh, these were pretty fancy hotels we were in. You know, the people there, even when we got into the airport, you can go around, you go in the offices and so on, everybody is there wearing their winter coats. Because there's no heat. And they go home and they got to wear their winter coats. There's no heat. And letting, there's hardly any lights. And there's, I guess, there's not that much food. So I don't know how, how I could imagine. I can't imagine uh, being cold all the time and not really having enough food to eat. You know, I guess you could look at a, a map of... Uh, North and South Korea, and you know, at night, those Google Maps, you see the north is black, and the south is all lit up. I mean, that's, you think, well, how can a country that's like that, how can they try to even think of waging a war against the United States, or even against the south? They would only do it if they, if they have to.
This is one of the hotels we stayed on in Kay Song, where that industrial center was that just got closed. I think this is the only uh, city that's in the northern side of the border that was not completely destroyed in the war. Because the U.S. and the South thought that they were going to ca capture it before the war ended, but they didn't. So they didn't want to bomb it to bits. So this is what traditional Korean architecture would look like. Here's looking out the, the front of our hotel street in the morning. Now they didn't let us go out at a hotel. There's only a few. We were with the, well I guess on most, most tours you just stay with the tour group anyways, but I mean I would not normally do that, but they did not. They said you had to stay in the hotel unless you're going out with a group or a tour guide. So we didn't interact with um, the Koreans too much. A little on the subway, restaurants, the park. But then, of course, you don't speak Korean. There's not much you can do anyways. Here we are. Recognize that picture, I suppose. On the other side. You always see the pictures of one North Korean soldier here, and another one there, and then another one there. And the, the person taking the picture is right here. This is in, these are the North Korean soldiers, and those are the South Korean and the U.S. soldiers. And I think. Yeah, those are South Korean. When they, I think the, the peep, our tour guide said, well, whenever Westerners come there on the northern side, the U.S. soldiers all go inside. You've seen that place before, right? Yeah. I was wondering, I mean, my, my image of it was these three Korean storage soldiers who are all looking very mean staring at each other in formal, so there's the spot where they're supposed to be, and they're not there. <laughs> they're just sort of casually hanging out right there. <coughs> Stan, where's the dividing line? Where is the... Right here. Oh. Oh. Uh-huh. Oh, that's the South Korean, I don't know. If you go to South Korea and you go to the Panmunjong, you'll go in there and you can see. show any more video or did you want to show yeah why am i running out of time because uh, no. i'm not looking at the time okay. no we, we, we you can get you got maybe another 15 five 20 minutes. minutes 15 20 minutes tops 15 or 20 minutes here's a group i was with he was an american from seattle he was a russian american who he would I don't know if I have pictures of the library. We went to the library in uh, Pyongyang, which has, they have 30 million books there. He was pretty uh, anti-communist with a lot of stereotypes of what communism was. So when they, they gave us a tour of the library, he said, well, you know, we have this thing, we can get you any book and like just order it and then in a minute or two on the conveyor belt the book will show up. So you want to try it, order a book. And so he said, I want to order a book. So okay, what's the book? 
And he said, I, I want to see the Bible. <laughs> Did he come? And then, 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 then the librarian said, well, there's a lot of different editions of the Bible, so which one do you want? I mean, there's, we have several different ones. And then the guy said, never mind. <laughs> There's this statue that you'll see everywhere. With a Why not? Here's what old Korea looked like. This was in Kaesong. What it would look like before the Korean War. Those are traditional houses. Here's some of the countryside. This is a uh, collective farm there. I remember I read in tour books that you weren't allowed to take pictures anywhere. But it wasn't any problem. Well, you can see a lot of the land, I noticed that a lot of the land, the hills, are don't have trees on them, which must be going to cause a serious flooding problems. Uh, oh, here's, this is a library. They're looking up books in the library, whatever the, you know, like the Chicago Public Library has those things. And here's the hallway and, the, and the coming into the library. Pyongyang had a lot more electricity than other cities. This is in Pyongyang. There's a reading room in the library. It was, it was cold. They're all wearing their jackets, as you see. We also went into an English class. The library there offers, uh, they have a whole bunch of free classes you can sign up for, like English, Spanish, or German, or I don't know, art, you name it. They have these free classes they offer to the people of Pyongyang. And you just got to put your name on a list, and when there's an opening, they call you, and you can go to the class in the library. sort of what the city colleges used to be like when they had free classes, but not anymore. This is a classroom we visited. What grade? What grade? Wow, this is a grade school. Uh, these are some of the kids there. I don't know how I got in the middle of that, but <clears throat> they did a dance show for us, which I did a little video of. They are pretty good. I thought it might be some kind of special school because they're all very talented, but I did take a picture of their schoolyard. That's their schoolyard, and that's their neighborhood. So it doesn't look very special right there. We went up north. We stayed in this hotel, which also, right now, see, there's no electricity there. And there wasn't any heat till we came. But the people are still working. As you see, it's snowing. So I don't know. This was March. I don't know what it's like to be there in January. Yeah. And to be like that all the time. Well, it was pretty beautiful there. This is right behind it. There's a, there's a river and in the mountains like that. This was a big tourist spot. I think in, in the years uh, 2000, from 1998 to 2008, there's a sunshine policy by the South Korean government where they did have good relations with North Korea and a lot of South Korean tourists went north and they had relaxed a lot of tensions and they had a lot of South Korean businesses were opening businesses in the north. 
But then after the 2008, very right-wing governments took power in the South, and their policy since 2008 has been to militarize the situation and to um, try to get more and more sanctions on the North and make them suffer as much as possible with the hope that the government will collapse. But I don't really think that is going to happen. Oh, that's not a very good picture of that place. Here's uh, one of the guys I interviewed, and one of them was a bus driver. You can guess which looks like. One of them, I think, was in their party. So which one do you think is the big banana, and which one is a bus driver? Can you tell? The one in the middle? <laughs> Well, he's the bus driver, that guy, the one on the left. He's the bus driver. He looks like one. Yeah, expression of whatever you want, whatever you say. Ah, okay. All right. Well, you're right, so I guess you know. Uh, oh, ten minutes. Well, I could show some of the... Uh, Maybe some of the video, because there's no sound in the video. That's fine. While you ask questions, this is street in Pyongyang. Because all I did in most of my videos was just stick my camera next to the window of the bus. So you're going to see what you would see if you're walking down the street in Pyongyang. Stan, what is that fruit, uh, pile of fruit you have there, Stan? What is that? slide of the food, the fruit, big green melon, melon. Where? Uh, scroll down. Keep going. This now we're getting into China. This is oh, China. Sorry. Go up. Go up. <laughs> Never mind. Oh, wait. Before I, I should go to the other. Uh, I don't remember taking any pictures of fruit. If I can close this, I was going to show you, oh, here was a border guard that I met and I started talking to. I told him I was an anti-war activist and, and I was an American. He was a border guard showing us around the border. He looked just like one of my neighbor's kids who I used to tutor. So, um... It's funny because after the tour and we got back on the bus and then he went and got on the bus and they walked to the back of the bus where I was with another guy and they sat down and then the other guy said, he wants to talk to you. And now all the other tourists on the bus were like, uh-oh. <laughs> but he wanted to know what my opinion was about uh, Korea having a bomb and what people's opinion in the United States were and so on. So I told him. I told him my opinion was not the typical one, but most Americans do not want to get involved in another war. These are, am I, I'm running out of time? These. Yeah, we want to start getting into questions. All right. When I can just put on the... Uh, I just went to Corio Tour. I just looked, Googled them. Um, Excuse me. Places that had uh, tours to North Korea, and I think there I saw three. There was New Democracy Tour, New Korea Democracy Tours, Choreo Tours, and um, Young Pioneer Tours. So I just did it through Choreo Tours. So what kind of uh, documentation do you need to go there? No, I just had to send in a... Uh, in the front page of my passport and uh, another picture for my uh, visa.
And that was it. Can you show the video while you're answering? Okay. Well, let's, let's thank our speaker. Thank our speaker. Okay. I'm going to try to get the video showing automatically. Uh, yeah, there was this report from the UN I was reading. It's called kp.1.un.org. It goes into all uh, the humanitarian needs of people Thank in North you. Korea. Their health problems, problems with the water system, clean water, malaria, yeah, tuberculosis, sure. um, malnourished people. Uh, I didn't know, I just looked at the UN thing. We went maybe 30 miles north of Pyongyang and then south to the border. Are we doing questions No. Now? This is a library. This is the question. Okay. Well, is it going to be an order? Yes. Uh, Jess. If you, do, if you can show it, I can just say what this is as you run them. Okay. No. So, see? Uh, that's a library. You could run them by those numbers I picked out. Okay. I think, so lousy. I think this is going to be questions. We are not going to have the two things going on. Well, yeah, I mean, Somebody you just want to look at it. Let's, well, let's just go to questions. All right. Destroy it. Next question. You have lots of lots of photographs. Did you did you find it difficult to take photographs? No. They, they told me a lot of rules when I went, but they didn't seem to enforce it at all. It sort of struck me as like when I was in a hotel in Beijing and I was on the non-smoking floor, but everybody was smoking. <laughs> it's, they told me I cannot take pictures of people in the military, I cannot take pictures of people unless I ask them, and I cannot take pictures outside of Pyongyang unless I asked them first, but I didn't do that, and other people didn't do that, and they didn't say anything. I think they just told, you have to tell tourists this, so they tell tourists this, and then it's like, okay, I told them, so. But the, the tour guides, were they, were they employees of the government? Or was yes. No, it was all. <coughs> yeah. They were your minders, the tour guides. Yeah, that's what they call them here, yeah. Other countries, they're called tour guides, right, they, except there. So what, is, what is the opinion of Stalin that's still held in that country? Well, the guy I talked to, I was going to wanted to put it in that interview, but I, I didn't ask him if that was okay to put in that question. He said that Stalin betrayed them in the Korean War. He says their army was running out of ammunition and weaponry fighting in the war, and that they kept asking Stalin for what rearmaments, whatever they call it, new supplies. Stalin never sent them anything. Just ignored them. So they said they had we had to withdraw all the way back way up because we just ran out of uh, ammunition. And it was only the Chinese that helped them. So he had a he had a pretty low opinion of Stalin. Yeah, have you seen the film Welcome to North Korea? If you can get it at Fasces. It's an interesting film because a Polish filmmaker was hired to do the 40th anniversary of the country before the Soviet Union collapsed. And he did the film, and then the Soviet Union and the Iron Curtain collapsed, and he got out of there with it. So it's a fascinating film, Welcome to North Korea. And parade. They're both available in passes to rent. In parade? Parade is about all this, these oh. hundreds of thousands of people with the placards and the, 
This is quite interesting, but welcome to North Korea. Yeah, one of my Western tour guides said I should go to North Korea and see those mass game shows because he said all the places he's been in the world, he's never seen anything so amazing as that. One thing that is interesting about um, Soviet Union, it, that was, I think, um, the only other country that they, that they had troops in after World War II and they took them out was, I think, Austria. When the rest of Western Europe, their troops stayed there. But in the North Korea, they left. It was rather interesting. It's the only communist country after World War II where the Soviet Union had troops that they took their troops out. They stayed in all the countries of Eastern Europe. But North Korea, they, in 1948, they all left. That's why all. Uh, we're interested in, in the communication that you had. Did you speak with people like from all walks of life? And Do you speak Korean or...? or no. So... Is, was your communication limited to those who spoke English? And um, why didn't you mention the child on the throne? The child that rules North Korea. Mention him? Yeah, you didn't discuss him at all. What, what do people think about him? And uh, how does he plug into your assessment of, of the risk? Well, the only, if I did speak Korean, I could have talked to Koreans in the hotel I was in, but since I can't, I could only talk to the tour guides, and they're not going to tell me anything that's not official position, so I didn't bother to ask them. All I can say that one of them I talked to, he praised very highly Kim Il-sung. And about the other leaders, he didn't say anything. And then I didn't say, I didn't ask him, well, how come you're not saying anything? All right, Ilya. I guess by omission, I get his answer. Louder. Speak up. My question is just for you. Give her a mic. I would like to know you. What? So Give her a mic. Big factories in Korea, yeah. in North Korea, it's like here, like private sector, or it's yeah. by government, like in Soviet Union. The factories? Yeah, factories, uh, hospitals, schools, it's like here, private sector, or uh, operate by private donor or... Um, unions or like in Soviet Union by government because government used to, to pay it's everything was free in education, medical care in Soviet Union, how it's in North Korea. Thank you. Yeah, it's free well. Schools here are government. Yeah. Well Chicago public schools are government. Right. Illinois of Chicago. Um they're all, uh, I think, government. There are special zones. There's two zones, I think, in the north that are private business. Part private, I guess, China and, and Korea. And then there's the Kaesan in the south, which is now closed, which was South Korean businesses in the north. But all, I guess all the rest is all government. So the government is allowing a lot more private farming now. And they're allowing farmers to sell a lot more on the market. It's not as rigid as they used to be. Uh, yeah, this market issue it interests me because if the impending war was for real, it's amazing to me that U.S. stock markets aren't predicting it or they're surging right now. And even the Japanese stock market is surging with Korea within uh, medium missile range. Uh, and it makes me wonder if, if the world is really taking it seriously. But secondly, as a financial consideration, do you think that Pyongyang is, is really uh, posturing 
for more aid from the World Bank, and the only way they can leverage is to rattle their sabers. Is, is there any school of thought on that, that this is all a pawn to get more aid from South Korean banks? Well, so long as there's no peace treaty, then the North has to spend a huge amount of its national, gross national product on the military. And that's, the people are suffering. They don't have heat or enough food and lights. But baby so that's, that's why they don't, that's why they want a peace treaty. Well, and I, but baby Kim uh, shaking, rattling the, the, the missiles, he really has it in his mind to leverage more aid for his country the one way he can, which may be to uh, threaten, threaten war. You mean blackmail? Blackmail. It's a bluff. Do you consider that, or are you taking it all for the trigger cocked for real? No, I like... Uh the tour agency, I went, I had, they had tours in April. All their tours are still continuing. Yeah, that too is. I mean, it, the tours would be ended if it was yeah, for real. Yeah, yeah, I think that. But I don't think, I mean, I don't, it's, I wouldn't phrase it the way you do. I mean, they need aid. They got sanctions against them. They're like, the U.S. has jammed them into a corner. So it's like, maybe you could say they're, overreacting to extreme provocation, but really I would think, you know, why is the U.S. doing this? They could just send them some food and then there'll be peace. That's all they would want. They could just say, okay, we'll sit down and we'll talk to you. That's all they, they would want, but the U.S. doesn't want to do that. <laughs> Mary Lou. Um, I want to ask about the food that they grow. Is rice their staple? Yes. Okay, and what what types of food are they able to provide for themselves, and what what is the type of food? Is, is it the quantity of all foods that they need more of, or are there particular foods that they can't grow and they can't eat? Um, I don't really know. I mean, I didn't really start reading a lot about Crete until maybe three months ago. But I, I did ask the tour guides, the Western tour guides, I asked them, because they've been going there for maybe 10 years, I asked them, well, how's the food? now that we get as tourists compared to what you got 10 years ago and they said it's better every year it gets better there's more variety of food did you go to any uh, grocery stores and supermarkets that the, no. that the people would have wanted no we didn't they didn't take us to any things to go see stuff like that Unfortunately, we spent a lot, about every day we went to some Kim Il-sung thing, right. monument, museum, a lot of Kim Il-sung every day. So the tour was very set, you, you couldn't? Yes. Okay. No, you could not go out on your own. No, I know you couldn't go out on your own, but could you ask for uh, some changes to go up? I don't know, to go through a bazaar or to go where, wherever a Korean shop. Because going to where food is being sold is, is one way to learn about another culture. Hey, we didn't do that. In India, by the way, is not as bad as you describe it. <laughs> it was I, so I been there for closest time. I've seen to what I think hell would be like. I, I got a question. Uh, why is it that North Korea, I understand North Korea does, will not negotiate with the South as a state party to a peace treaty? Is that directly with the South? Well, at least that was their position. When did it change? Because they have said in the past that the South was only a puppet of the U.S. and uh, they were going to talk to the U.S. about the war, not to the South Koreans. Is that still their position? They, 
During that sunshine policy, the North and South Korean leaders met in 2000 and 2007. <coughs> well, I guess they talked about, a, they must have talked about that and a lot of things. Okay. Well, so they talk, not now. Okay. Well, now the South Korean government won't talk to them, period. Right. Right. It's not, it's... Yes, it is. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's just their own, uh, you know, sort of, well, did, did they have uh, a sort of certain disregard, uh, a steering away from your, you know, your standard unmentionable types, people who were actually impoverished, or people who they might not have wanted to, to associate with what they're up to their guide, um, just people in general that, um, people in general that would have added to a sort of uh, pristine cultural perspective that they wanted you to have. That's my first question. The other one is, well, what's the, what kind of well, you know, do they have big flashing signs with Coca-Cola? I mean, well, what, what, would be, what would be the equivalent of this? It's not just, it's just not, there's, there's, there's things that they have to buy with some kind of currency. I, I'm sure that they have some form of advertising. So, no. Well, only I just read in one of the books that the stores are not like McDonald's or Sears or something. They're just like shoe store, clothing store, electronic store. It is defined by function. Um, and most of the time we're in Pyongyang and the people in Pyongyang live better than people in other places. So... There we would le least likely place to see hunger. I noticed that I didn't see any people who were over. I saw one person who was overweight, and then there's the President Kim who's overweight. <laughs> That'd be like two people. Two people. <laughs> um, what was your other part? I forget. <laughs> Well, in the videos, we uh, we did go around a lot in the bus, and I could see a lot. But I, you know, I don't think they were trying to. Maybe they were trying to hide things from you, but still, you can still see an awful lot, whether they're trying to hide it or not. When you ask, did you ask questions about them? Well, I did ask one of them about the food situation, and he said it was not satisfactory yet. But if I read this UN report, that's an understatement. <coughs> Art Kazar, you didn't mention no. anything about the political system in North Korea. Did you discuss it with anyone? Like, I mean, the people there didn't elect the current leader, and it seems almost like it's a communist monarchy than more than a any type of, uh, compared to, let's say, uh, uh, Vietnam or any other, or Cuba. Uh, I mean, this is like a family-run biz business, and it's failing, and uh, it doesn't seem like there's any input or opposition allowed. Did you discuss Well, I think they do have some kind of... It's hard to understand, because, like, there was this big conference of all these light industry people of, like, 10,000, we got together in Pyongyang to discuss about how to improve light industry. So obviously they're getting input from all over the country to figure out what to do next to, to work on the problem. But on the other hand, there's this leadership that seems to be like they decide everything. But it's hard for me to resolve. I don't know enough about it how you can have these big conferences of people to discuss about what to do. I mean, that seems to be like a pretty democratic way to do it, but then they have this leadership that seems to, they say that they're doing everything. Well, it could also be, just to follow up, that the conference is made up of people who are very tight with the regime from different areas of the country, and they're the ones that get to go to these conferences. Well, because that's what's happened. That was used to happen in the Soviet Union. It was only like the people who were in the party and and obeyed the party line who could go to some kind of you know uh, industrial conference or go abroad or things like that. Well, I've been to uh, Cuba, China, Soviet Union, Vietnam, and in this country we lump them all as being communist, and they're all like this and this. 
and you go to these countries and it's like they don't have very much in common in how they work they're all very different kind of countries they might be like Europe Western Europe and the United States might be more similar in how they run their systems than those communist countries are um, I didn't I get the impression that the government is respected I mean like you can go um, if I go to the mausoleum and they see these people crying over Kim Il Sung and Kim Jong I mean they're not told to do that they do it behind your problem I think I saw two dogs. They do have dog soup. I did try it. I don't don't recommend it. Oh yeah. Well, the only things they use in the farms are for the farming now, or the oxen. They have some horses. They don't use machinery because they don't have oil. Why don't they have oil? Did China supply them with stuff? A little, but not it. I mean, the Soviet Union gave it to them very cheap. I suppose now they have to buy at market price, which is much more expensive. Is their economy so poor that they're unable to do that? Yes. Is that perhaps because they divert so much toward the military? Hmm. Do they have too many people on the rise? They want to sign a peace treaty so they don't have to do that in the U.S. and won't do that. So... It's hard to say. You can't really be nice to say, well, blame them for that, but I can't. U.S. could easily say, okay, we'll sign a peace treaty and you can disarm. And they'd probably say, okay, we'll disarm now. The U.S. won't do that. You know, when when have you ever, in the last month, have you read in any American newspaper, well, they say, why don't we call them up and why don't we talk to the government of North Korea? Has any American newspaper, any writer and any editorial person ever said, why don't we talk to them? Yes, I've no. seen it. They have? Yes. No, they really haven't. No. Yeah. All right. I'm, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name already. That's, that's no, you, you said you'd call on this way. Please. The name is Bob. Bob. Yeah. Uh, Stan, what, in your opinion, uh, has motivated the United States government opposition to, uh, to North Korea? For, for, you know, since 1948, 1950. 45? Yeah, 45. What, could, could you give us your opinion about that? Well, the U.S. defeat in the Korean War was the first time the U.S. suffered a defeat. defeat. We weren't defeated in the Korean War. They were, U.S. tried to conquer all of Korea, and they were defeated in that. Right? Um, they, yeah. The war was over What war? Korean War. July 15th. But I don't, the U.S. was defeated in Vietnam, but they have relations with Vietnam, so I'm not, uh, that's because we won in Vietnam. <laughs> Nike, Nike, so the U.S. Now. wants to overthrow the government there, make all of uh, Korea capitalist. 
That would be the best thing for them. And then they want the U.S. wants to have its troops right Don't on the border of China, China right there. I was going to say, and that's a major worry for China. And that's why they entered the war anyways in the 1950s. Okay. With the mausoleums, are the bodies on public display? Yeah. So that's part of the cult. See, Joe, that I've got. And I've got work to do. All right. Let's see. Korea. Uh, demographics is Korea's, North Korea's population, is it growing, is it shrinking, are people encouraged to use birth control, what, what's um, the average family size? <coughs> I don't know. Alright. Uh, got a question over here. Yeah. Yeah. Please speak. Please speak. Your impression of the disabled is all any visibly disabled, obviously disabled, and how they were treated, how accessible <coughs> the society was, were, were there ramps for people in wheelchairs, were there, did you see anybody with a guide dog or a hearing aid, or, or do they keep that sort of thing quiet behind the scenes? Um, I don't, uh, did I see anybody with um, disabilities and how were they treated? Were there wheelchairs and ramps? I don't recall that. But that doesn't mean that they're like kept behind the scenes. I kind of doubt it since the slaughter that went on in the Korean War. They had to have so many disabled people that it had to be pretty normal. Yes. But you know, I, I, I was not allowed to go walk the streets, so... I'm sorry, your name? Hi, my name is Tammy Kurtz. We're here um, with the Social Justice Project um, in uh, the state. I don't even live in your state. Um, and um, I do want to comment on the current leader, obviously. There'll be, there'll be, a, there'll be, a, comment, there'll be a comment period. Oh, oh, questions. After questions, will be, each of you will get a chance to comment on... Okay, great, then a comment period. I'm sorry. Right, no problem at all. No, don't worry. I'm so sorry. No, I'm good, thanks. Just to add to, to the disability question, what is the situation, the tolerance for human rights, uh, let's say LGBTQ? <coughs> what does that mean? I don't have any idea. Okay. <clears throat> um, I have a question. And that is, uh, in uh, Korea there were... Uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, North Korean Christians. Uh, the uh, Presbyterians, uh, Methodists were particularly strong in uh, the yeah, Roman Catholic too. Uh, uh, what's happened to those churches of people? Um, there are two evangelical churches in Pyongyang and one Catholic church. But most people there are Buddhist. A lot, a lot more Buddhist temples. The tour guide told me during the Korean War, the churches and the Christian hospitals and Christian schools all put big crosses on the top of their buildings so that they wouldn't get bombed by the U.S. But they all got bombed by the U.S. anyways. So I guess that kind of disillusioned them with Christianity. <laughs> Okay. Slay your Christian neighbor or by them be slain, right? Uh. But I was thinking, I, I thought about your question a lot because I've been in uh, about how much is the leadership control thing and how much democracy is there. It seems like there's a lot of, they do everything by meetings, they do everything by groups, they do everything by. Everything goes on in their lives. It happens in groups. You're a part of a group. Here we're brought up to be individual. That's number one. Yeah. But in there, you do things as part of a group. 
and you all work together as a group. So there has to be a lot of group discussion and so on. But on the other hand, you read like their go to their news website and it's all about what the leaders doing everything. And it's hard for me to resolve that contradiction. They don't have a free press like we do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go to. If there's no more questions, let's go to our mother. Do you have uh, internet access uh, when you were in uh, North Korea? No. All right. Dangerous. Okay. Oh, well, that was good. They don't. They didn't allow that. They have some in intranet. About the nuclear threat, threatening so many nations with the first strike. Surely they realize how utterly devastating this will be to the whole world if they launch one nuke and it hits another country and how many innocent lives it would destroy. Um, do you think North Korea is at all justified in making so many threats to so many countries? Nuclear threats, first strike? Well, that's how it's portrayed here, but I certainly don't think that they're going to initiate that. They're going to do it as a response. No, that's not how it's presented at all. I know that's not how it's presented here. Lying totally? It reminds me of uh, when Y2K, what was it called? Y2K. When they said, well, 2000, all the internets are going to go down, everything's going to crash, it's going to be a disaster. And they had that over and over and over in the news here. That Christmas I was spent in, in London, England, and there was nothing about that at all. And if I was going to ask people, aren't you worried about that? They probably would have thought I was out of my mind. I think that's... Here, people think that North Korea is actually going to launch some missiles, just initiate a war, which is just, it's absurd. But that's what they say in this country. Okay. There's no way that would happen. I got a question about the economy. Other countries you mentioned. All right. Ho, ho. One fool at a time. It's a question going on, lady. Well, I think they would want to open up more to the market. You think so? I mean, I don't know. That's not a picture I get. I don't know. <laughs> the, the other communist countries have opened up to the markets, and how, why hasn't North Korea? They have more, I think, this since they have several different industrial special zones where the foreign businesses invest in. Some in the north and one, one near the border with South Korea. I'm sure they would welcome that. Okay, Mike Foley. Could you again talk about what aid the United States has given them? I think the United States used to give them food. Mm -hmm. I think they used to give them or sell them cheap fuel oil. Mm -hmm. And didn't the United States help, help them build a nuclear reactor or something like that? The U.S. made a deal with them that if they closed their nuclear reactor, they would build a light water nuclear reactor, reactor and supply them with oil. So many... 500,000 gallons a year or something. They made this agreement in 1994. North Korea shut down their nuclear reactor and, and uh, ended their program, but the U.S. didn't follow through. And I, I read later in one of these books that, well, the U.S. made that agreement in 1994 because they were quite sure that North Korea was going to collapse, and so they never had to honor the agreement. So... Is there, a chance, is there a chance that this whole North Korea thing is just another lackey colony of the empire 
<laughs> because you, you did say that the United States has built all kinds of, we're militarizing all parts of Asia, supposedly because we're mad at North Korea. But actually, you, you make some remark about the real target is China. In other words, the American Empire tells this guy in North Korea to make a lot of noise so he can build more missile bases or whatever in Asia. You know, he's just a, a, a lackey. Of, we can use wait, him, wait, him wait as for the an enemy as an excuse to militarize the Western Pacific. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. It's using North Korea as an excuse. Yeah. And it's also using this situation to distract us from the cuts happening in Social Security and Medicare. Yeah, I remember you mentioned it too, guys. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Gene. Last question. Uh, I'm thinking about Cuba in, in mind. However, you. Uh, mentioned something about uh, embargo. Is North Korea, uh, uh, the embargo that we uh, have against North Korea, is it similar to the one in Cuba? And if your question is X, I got another question. I think the North, the Cuban embargo is more extreme blockade is more extreme but then the US well the US sells them food sometimes so I'm not sure historically the, the blockade of Cuba has been more extreme probably the most extreme of any Was you another question? Let's, let's go to questions. Uh, somebody mentioned something about North Korea jotting the market. Hmm? Some question, somebody asked a question or made a comment about North Korea. In other words, why don't you jump? I believe the gentleman over there. In other words, why aren't they part of the commercial, international commercial, the commercial, international uh, uh, business procedures or whatever, exchange, import, exports or whatever. Why weren't they that? Well, I thought about Cuba, and I have a little knowledge about Cuba because I've been there. <clears throat> now, if there is a blockade in Parque and restriction here, restriction there, the same kind of international visit, at least from the United States to there, is obvious. It's no no kind of What's your business question? deal there. Is that correct? Yeah. So so, so it, my, my question is, is, is North Korea is not in the business world, the, the global thing, because of the, the embargo or the blockade? Well, it's not blockade, it's embargo. No, I think North Korea used to have a lot of trade, but then their economy collapsed in the early 90s. So, one friend of mine did mention to me once that if U.S. let North and South Korea unite and Japan let that happen, Korea would be a pretty big economic power in Asia. Yes. And they don't want that competition. So, it's in their interest to keep it divided and keep the situation the way it is. It's the interests of U.S. and Japan. Brom, let's go to rebuttals. Oh, yeah, let's go. Rebuttals, Brom. Come on, Brom. Time for the rebuttals. Yay! Yay. 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 Very good. 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 All right, Brom, just a quick reminder. I would like to see how many people have remarks to make. Besides uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Okay. 
Just a reminder, just a reminder that these proceedings are going to be videotaped for eventual distribution to the internet, so keep that in mind. <laughs> Four minutes. First one, let's go. First, our first commentator will be Joe Mayer. He was hypnotized. Thank you, Ronald. Um, I want to thank our speaker again for giving us a, an insight into the North Korean situation that we never are exposed to here in the United States or probably anywhere else in the world. Um, first of all, in response to Karina's uh, question on the population stability in North Korea, remember with no heat in the winter and equal rights between men and women, um, it, it encourages intimacy, but it raises the question, who's going to sleep on the wet spot? <laughs> Um, it also raises the question in my mind, why is there not unilateral uh, disarmament in the uh, North Korean people? Is it actually a fear that they will be invaded by the United States and uh, South Korea? Probably. But again, it's a, it's, it's a question that uh, raises... Uh, serious specters on uh, the, the sincerity of the North Korean government. Um, there has never been a communist nation in the uh, current history of the world. Never. Not in the Soviet Union, China, North Korea, Cuba. There are socialistic uh, governments, socialistic nations, some of which have the characteristics of a communist country, but they are not communist. Um, one of the other interesting aspects on the creation or the instigation of the Korean War uh, involves the disparity, the, the, the manipulations of the United States, uh, the uh, elections that were held on the Korean Peninsula when the United States realized that they, the, uh, South, the corrupt South Korean government under Sigmund Rhee would, would uh, lose. Uh, that was one of the problems, of course. But the other problem, the, the other instigating uh, uh, character was the Soviet Union, the USSR's um, determination to determine the readiness of the United States in a local war. And they instigated the uh, invasion of, the, of South Korea by the North Korean army in order to test the readiness and the uh, deployment techniques uh, of the United States Army. I have no other comment. <laughs> the thing that I want to remind uh, everybody is about that uh, many years ago, Carl Sagan was uh, uh, the one who studied the potential of a nuclear winter by using 500 nuclear bombs. They were thinking that 500 of the big bombs will produce several decades of lack of sun, which would freeze the sea, the rivers, lakes, and life would not be the same again. Now, today, with the knowledge that uh, was acquired by satellites, studying the circulation of the oceans, the atmosphere, and so on, the fact is that 40 Hiroshima-type bombs will produce that nuclear winter. And we are playing with this fire. And it seems like we are totally oblivious to the fact that we are coming closer and closer to that, that disastrous event. The uh, uh, one nuclear exchange, whether it's North Korea or Afghanistan or India, that will trigger uh, uh, at least uh, 200 to 300 small bombs, these 
Hiroshima type bombs, so way, way above what is necessary to produce that nuclear winter. Do we really have such a blind uh, spot that we cannot confront that and tell our leaders to start preventing that from happening and not doing what we're doing? That's my comment. Uh, thank the speaker. Uh, it was an interesting talk. Of course, almost everything he said was the opposite of what I've heard for years. So what do I make of that? Well, the first thing I make of that is that I know more about U.S. history than the international history. And uh, I read a book called Lies My Teacher Told Me by James Lowen. The point of, the, of that book is our uh, U.S. history is at best celebratory, but I call it uh, a lot of lies. A lot of it is lies. The way I try to avoid that is to read a lot of historians and then try to figure out, after I've read a number of books, what actually happened. Uh, so that's one thing. I would imagine the international history is as bad as the... Uh, as the uh, U.S. history I read. Uh, the second thing is, uh, when I hear the speaker, I've got to ask myself, do I believe the U.S. government? And do I believe the last couple of presidents we've had? I've got one answer to that. No. Okay. The third thing is, you may not like Michael Moore, but I think he's pretty good. And one of the things he said in, in one of his movies, I think it's Rolling, Bowling for Columbine, I think it is. This country is saturated with fear. And I'm a fearful person, so I, I buy into a lot of that. But uh, I think that's something we really ought to take into account, that this country is that we got a lot of more fear than confidence, uh, realistic confidence. Thank you. I trust the government for as I can throw this room. A government is supposed to give the people what they want to give them. And that's true with, I would say, all governments. And our government is real good at that. They didn't practice it. Now, the version that you get, you got three or four versions. You got A and B opinion. Then you got the government that got some reason to say what they say. And they'll call that the official version. Then you got the other one. And those, the propagandist types, you know, uh, you can turn on the radio or the TV, and you got talking heads, you can pick up a newspaper, and all of that in there is a bunch of bullshit to attract the attention of the masses, the public, while you looking this way, they can be doing whatever the fuck they want over here. And I don't buy that, and I want to thank the speaker because he thinks the same way. And that was a good speech, sir. It just sound like you balance, and you ain't pulling this side or that side. You're telling it like it is. Now, I was in Cuba, I mentioned that, uh, 11 years ago. And by the way, I had a license. They were talking about sitting on Bonsi Knoll and JC down in Cuba, blah, blah. The people had a license. And where do you get your license from? From the United States government. What branch? The Treasury Department. So we down there legal, and we follow the rules. Now, when I went there, and I'm glad that he reminded me, and you bring back this, and I have to comment on it. It's nothing like you, the individual, doing your own research and searching for the truth, unbiased, and drawing your conclusion. It doesn't get any better than that. I 
how can a grown man, a grown woman, could think in other way? Now, here in the United States, like I said, you hear all the version. For instance, Miami. If you're talking about Cuba, you got, I call it the Miami version. You got the Miami version, right? Now, when I get to Cuba, I got the Cuban version. Now, what that gives me, that gives me a choice to make a decision on this or that based on my critique, my analysis, my thoughts, and the facts and the circumstances that can lead to certain facts. That's up to me, okay? And that should be for anybody because Miami's version was different from the Cuban version. In the Cuban version, you get there and you see these people, uh, well, almost all of them can speak English. Ain't one place, I've been over a bunch of places, and ain't one mama came up and tell me to see me tonight. Ain't no taxi driver say, hey, I can take you over here Well, you got some women. I, all of somebody approached me in Cuba was the kid, uh, the young men selling me the $300 sick. Well, they gonna sell it for $75, $100. If I go in the store, I got to pay $300. That's all. And, and I'm looking at, and the people can tell me, you know, I don't read about this revolution, whether it's the Al revolution, whether it's China, whether it's Russia or France. It's good when somebody can tell you why they fight, how they fall, and why they did this, and how they feel now. This is coming right out of folks' mouth to me. So when I leave Cuba, I got a, 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 the information and what I need to know in order for me to make a decision. And when I make that decision, my decision is as great as anybody's in the world. So people, the official version is their version. And the official version is never right. Why is never right? When you got motives, and the motives is not uh, uh, ulterior motive, then what you tell people should be taken and stuffed up your ass. <laughs> I would like to thank our speaker, first of all, for an interesting talk, regardless of whether I agree with his politics or not. Uh, I am, however, somewhat skeptical that the North Korea is the worker's paradise that he portrayed it as being. Um, first of all, our good friend, first of all, our good friend Art Kazar back there, whose credentials, regardless of whether I agree with his politics or not, his credentials of his member of the left are are quite solid. And he pointed out earlier. <laughs> he pointed out quite correctly earlier that Stalin did indeed sponsor conferences uh, dealing with light industry and many other matters, and that uh, the people who attended these conferences were indeed tied very closely to the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and the Soviet government. Uh, and so I find it kind of hard to believe that any such gathering in Pyongyang is not also tied into their party and their government. Um, I'm sorry, I consider the Korean War to be a success. Uh, the North Koreans and the Chinese were driven back to the 48th parallel. The South Korean, the South Korean government uh, in South Korea, regardless of what I think of their government, I don't think very much of it. Nevertheless, the South Korean uh, South Korea was, uh, was I will not use the, I hesitate to use the word liberated, but let us say that the communists were driven out. It was never the U.S. government's plan to conquer all of Korea. That was General MacArthur's idea. And after, in fact, General MacArthur botched it, and after he defied President Truman once too often, who was trying to keep it a limited war precisely so that it did not involve the use of nuclear weapons, President Truman finally had enough and fired him. Something that was, did not sit well with the American people. We we'll let President Truman know this in no uncertain terms. President Truman was unfazed. As far as he was concerned, he had done the right thing in firing General MacArthur, 
And I, in fact, happen to agree with that. Um, finally, I would say, with regard to uh, a nuclear strike, or with regard to the North Korean saber rattling, which is what it amounts to, it's a response to what? The U.S. government, to the best of my knowledge, has no plans to invade North Korea. What for? We're just now getting out of wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and I have very grave doubts that the U.S. government at this point in time is interested in getting us bogged down in, in any other needless land war anyplace else. Thank you. Why do we Americans love war? Anybody know? I uh, was on Facebook today and uh, a friend of mine uh, posted that he, he can't wait till we make North Korea into a parking lot. I mean, suburban fancies. Anyway, I just, I wrote down, I wrote down five lines here. Um, we're supposed to be, we're supposed to believe that uh, the North Korean dictator is, he wants war, okay. Uh, five lines here. Does anybody remember the Gulf of Tonkin? Nope. I mean, okay. Do we, does anybody remember in 1953 when we installed the Shah of Iran? And, whoa, we can't figure out now why they're pissed off at us. Hello. Um, Noriega was on the CIA payroll. And uh, what did we do in 1989? We invaded Panama. Wow. Wow, we kicked ass, huh? Yeah, that looks John Wayne. All right, uh, line number four. We installed Saddam Hussein in 1968. Am I correct? Am I correct? In the 60s? With the help of the MI6 and the CIA. And then what happened to wars with Iraq? All right, so we created those monsters. Then what else did we do? We supported Saddam, uh, Osama bin Laden, right? And then what happened? We invade Afghanistan and he's in Pakistan. So, you know, before you start waving your flags and, oh, let's go kick their ass, just think about the Gulf of Tonkin. That's all. Hi, actually, uh, that's, a, that's an excellent point. Uh, that, um, that wars sort of focus the information a little bit. Um, there, I, I, I feel like I'm coming under, um, coming under the weather of something I'm now, I'm sure I've not coined this, but I'm going to call information fatigue. And it, you know, it's, it's an evolution of compassion fatigue when there's simply too many things that I could care about and in no uncertain terms cannot. Um, but this, this Korean situation is sort of becoming an epitome of those because while thousands of miles away and uh, seemingly outside of the realm of things that matter to me, um, uh, it, 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 now that there's a, there's a possibility of another military conflict, though I think that's very low, um, it's definitely becoming something I can't I can't turn away from. Well, at the same time, the more I would focus on it, it is obviously hard for me to contribute to any sort of cause that will raise awareness, that will change something, that will put the thought into people's minds that there's really somewhere to go with uh, with the um, with the ideas that come about what's going on uh, in in the American public and our opinions about things that. Um, are you know are just swarmed with uh, um, various parties lines um, and uh, like this gentleman said um, it's really easy to become distracted first by the mainstream media and its its tactics and then by trying to combat them when in fact the real the real at the real fight is is doing something real about it. I don't know whether it's a protest, whether it's uh, writing writing to senators, whether it's uh, getting together and establishing article, uh, establishing news feeds, whatever it may be. But um, one thing that I'm, I, I'm finding it hard to do is pay attention through all of this. Um, maybe it's because, you know, I'm from the ADHD generation, but it also very much might come as a result of um, of the general, what feels like an unfocused um, approach to the topic. 
Um, I, I there were some very important things that you uh, illuminated. I'm sorry, I'm horrible with names. Uh, Stan, you uh, illuminated us to in ter specifically in terms of um, um, the sort of receptiveness that they had to towards you. I my I imagined, oh, you know, here's this guy from America. He's coming here to not only judge us but to bring back horrible, I horrible stories about us. Um, and our, and our, you know, f strong communist ways and all sorts of things, but it seemed, you know, you ran into a, an army guard and you had a conversation with him and he was open-minded enough, um, for, um, obviously for some of the same reasons that you were, which you hadn't run into each other before, um, and that, you know, there's that very real human contact there that makes this all something that's very appealing to me. Um, but I, I cannot, I, I'm just, this third time, I can't stress enough that this is, it feels like I feel, which is very unfocused in, um, in the intention of where the information is sort of leading. What can we do about this? I don't know. That's all. Well, our uh, speaker today mentioned very briefly that uh, if you look at the difference between North and South Korea uh, at night, North Korea is very dark and you'll see scarcely a light here or there, while in South Korea there's all kinds of neon lights and the place is lit up and there's a tremendous amount of nightlife and people are having a good time and uh, in South Korea I don't think they have very much of a hunger problem at all uh, while I'm sure that in North Korea hunger is a very real problem uh, one reason there isn't a big hunger problem in South Korea is because the people have jobs making those neon lights and making Hondais and other such things, keeping the people employed and keeping money in their jeans and being able to support their families and so forth. I uh, don't think that the United States should give five cents to North Korea just on the strength of the fact that they're communists. But on the other hand, when they start threatening, I think we shouldn't give them anything at all under any circumstances, and not even food aid. If we ask uh, the people in Eastern Germany today, hey, uh, pal, uh, are you a little better? You think maybe you're a little better off now than when uh, the Soviets controlled uh, uh, your part of Germany? I think that uh, virtually all of them would say, "Oh no, 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 we're far better off now." I believe that one day North Korea will collapse, and that they will eventually unite with South Korea under the flag of friendship, uh, uh, I'm sorry, under the flag of freedom a in a democratic uh, type country, and the world will be better off for it. The last time that there was a military action, they had Russia and China on their side. Uh, that's no longer the case. My name is uh, Lee Ping Yuan. Uh, I'm uh, very interested in uh, Korea, uh, either South Korea or North Korea, because I think this is a, a group of people or the, the people uh, it's most uh, like a, a group activity and it's most loyalty, it's most uh, uh, united. Uh, I deal with some uh, 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 Korean uh, friends, uh, they they are really united. They can uh, a small group of uh, Korean. They can very united in uh, in the in in 
our society. And uh, I think that's uh, either north or south, uh, this is the a typical situation. In north, it's represented as a, a dictatorship, and the people are very loyal, very supportive. So even they are in very bad shape. They don't have food and the basic necessities like the heat. They still support their leaders uh, blindly, and unfortunately. Uh, in the South Korea, they are also, uh, they form very big conglomerate uh, like Samsung, Hyundai, and the, they are, the, the employees are very loyal and very supportive to, to their, their uh, billionaires. So I think this is a common situation and uh, uh, in the West world, I feel the Western world, especially United States, maybe uh, it's heavily influenced by the re religion. And uh, that, I think that's another form of uh, loyalty. And uh, in the uh, East Asia, like including China, Japan, and uh, uh, people are following Confucius uh, ideas the major point of Confucius idea is loyalty. So no matter who is the king on the top, once you change the dynasty, then you should follow, you should obey and uh, loyal to the king. Uh, I think that's very deep in the roots of uh, East Asia people. Uh, I was born in Taiwan. I experienced that because uh, when I was born, Chiang Kai-shek is the leader in Taiwan and uh, for 40, 50 years. And after he died, his son succeeded. And uh, in Japan, is still there's a king and the queen and the emperor there. And uh, in China, yeah, there's no, no, this kind of monarchy uh, uh, system in the political system. I think one of the reasons is uh, Chairman Mao's son was died in the Korean War. war. So I think it may be good uh, <laughs> in that sense. And uh, right now on the world, probably just Saudi Arabia has uh, this kingdom system. Another society is, uh, is have that kind of system is actually Singapore. Singapore, the old uh, uh, prime minister, uh, retired, and uh, his son is coming up. So in that part of country, religion, in part, that part of Asia, religion is not important, but uh, loyalty is reflected on the political system. Just, that's just my point of view. Thank you. I appreciate all of the comments um, that everybody said. And um, I want to add to the comment, obviously, um, with a question at first. And I don't need any answers. I just need you to think about it. Where were you when you were 29 years old? What were you doing? What kind of responsibilities did you have? Kim um, from North, uh, North Korea, the, the leadership, um, just celebrated his 29th birthday a few days ago. Um, now, he also has a lot of older brothers and sisters that wanted his position. Um, so, I, I'm on the humanitarian side, I'm not on the political side of things. Um, and the comment that I want to make is we want to, uh, he wants a peace treaty, he wants to blend in, and, and you had commented, um, um, Stan, Stan, right? Okay. Um, yeah, when you would ask the question, um, uh, you know, did anybody talk to him yet? Did any of the officials from any of the states or nations talk to him? Did any of the, did any of the nations give condolences when his father died? Um, the answer would be, their answer would be no. Dennis, Dennis, exactly. 
Dennis, right, Dennis, who does live in Newport Beach, he still does have a home there, um, and I'm from California, too, not far from him. Um, that, that's, that's Dennis Rodman J. with the con con that got condolences. So, in other words, what I'm trying to say is he, it, it, the, the young leader of North Korea nation is only going to react to retaliation from the United States. They do, he doesn't want to, to he, he only, he doesn't, he does not want to, to blow up anybody's nation. He wants to be part of the world, but, but nobody even bothered to call him at all, um, or talk with him. So, it's, I know it's hard to understand, but, um, but, but he, he's a person too, everybody, everybody, um, Needy. He's he's in a person with the the youngest leadership um, too. So I just that's something to think about. I'll be there. I'll be there. I got a short yeah. in church. Well, the um, yeah, but North Korea uh, is, and they have suffered a great deal from uh, uh, drought and uh, and floods and uh, from the. Uh, the kind of uh, uh, military discipline that, that they have been living under, uh, and also they uh, they feel that they are, are uh, challenged by the South Korean uh, uh, regime. Uh, the uh, the attack in 1950 uh, was a question of which group uh, of Koreans would attack the first. Uh, and uh, I think Syngman Rhee and his government uh, were uh, at least as culpable as uh, anybody in North Korea. Uh, they, uh, the, but the North Koreans got or the uh, weaponry uh, from from the Koreans who had been fighting w under uh, the communists in, in uh, China. They helped liberate uh, China from the Japanese and uh, from uh, and, and when they were repatriated. Uh, in uh, 49, uh, the uh, North Korean army was swollen and uh, they, they were repatri repatriated with their weapons. At that point, uh, the, uh, the question of, of who was going to rule Korea uh, became a military question. Uh, and uh, it, uh, uh, is not resolved to this day. And there was only a truce resolved uh, in 54, and uh, that is the North Korea, South Korea uh, line of demarcation, and it's a, a truce line, not a, a peace line. Uh, one, uh, how the uh, Koreans can be reunited, uh, the, uh, is a good question. 
It is the question that uh, the Koreans have to live with, and uh, it's uh, one that the rest of the world has to live with too, because it's a, a live question and uh, for the Koreans. Well, uh, can it be resolved? Well, it's a question of the will, not only of the Koreans, but of their neighbors. And uh, when uh, David Travis tells us that uh, all the uh, East Germans were very thankful uh, for the uh, uh, merger with uh, West Germany, they were not. Uh, they, they had a, a market and, uh, in the common turn, and uh, they were uh, doing relatively well uh, in that market. Uh, and uh, since then, they've faced widespread unemployment. Uh, Your time's time up. has elapsed. All right, let's again, let's thank my neighbor from Bridgeport, Sam, for coming back again and giving us another fascinating travel log. You may not be aware of it, the late Quinn Brisbane used to do this, and I, he's passed on. Maybe you can fill the bill. I enjoy these evenings where we get to visit other countries and take a look at other cultures. I'm going to be eclectic as usual here. Uh, whoops. You, uh, you really have to look at Asia as uh, your perspective, I, at least mine, is, is, is taking a look at Asia because you've got a number of different countries with a totally different uh, culture and historical circumstances, unlike in the West. Um, certainly, there's no country that, among the many countries that suffered in World War II, the, the Koreans certainly were put through some incredible situations under the Japanese occupation. You alluded to a few of those in there. And then, to be followed up by another several years of madmen like Curtis LeMay, destroying your place. I mean, this, this doesn't get any worse than that. You know, this maniac is let loose to destroy your your country. You know, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't really care about this materialism comparison. There's, I think right now, 193 countries in the United Nations in all various stages of economic um, development, this materialism is possibly the worst gauge whatsoever. You have to look upon it as a culture, not some sort of material provision, libertarian kind of pedestrian notion of looking at what's really going on in the place and what is the conditions of their lives here. I mean, the fact that they get together and make collective decisions isn't something that we, I don't, they don't understand that here, Stanley. This, we're told by some rich guy what to do. And we're told to kind of like, like it, you know, 1% decision making, you know, a bureaucracy. I believe you may I deal with it all the time. They don't, they don't know what you're talking about here. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, why I approach this in the concept of Asia, do you, do you really want this country to turn into like one of the other ones where the people are enslaved by multinational corporations and sweatshops and jumping off the roofs of factories and things of that nature? There seems to be a price tag attendant to this ostensibly higher standard of living. I don't know if that's really what, is that worth it? 
mean, that people are doing so. I, I, I certainly hope they resist that. And more power to them. And I hope they stay the course and they don't succumb to some gibberish. Food has always been an issue in Asian countries. That's not new. That's probably the history of Asia, the history of China secure food and things like that. Doesn't surprise me at all. But last of all, um, I just want to thank you again. That was a very fascinating thing. There's one thing, though, you have to realize about Stanley now. The kind, I know this because we have the Unity Center, the, the headquarters in Bridgeport, that when you deal with communists, never let them look you in the eye because they'll brainwash you, hypnotize you. That's probably what happened to you, Stanley. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody I think who comes back from there has the same pictures, right? <laughs> 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 So don't let them look you in the eye. All right, thanks a lot, Bill. Here is what I have to say about North Korea. It, it is very simple. It is a government ran by a dictatorship. It is a government ran like a large corporation. It is a government that keeps its workers at very low wages, promises you the, the world, and then doesn't know how to pay for it. The big problem I see if Kim Il-sung or the current leader really wanted to bring his people out of poverty, if he really wanted to get his people back into the mainstream, he would open up North Korea. He has the trading partner China on one side, South Korea on the other side, and he has something that both are looking for, and that's cheap labor willing to work and develop. I cannot think of a better way that will bring prime conditions for investment into that country pending that he has a good rule of law. That country is primed and ready for development. The only thing is, is you've got a family that controls it. Much like Eastern Germany in the 80s, much like Berlin, you had, a, you had one part that was capitalistic and relatively open and free, and another one that was under a lot of repression. And I think we should remember the words paraphrased of Ronald Reagan. Mr. Soong, if you want peace and you want prosperity for your people, go to the DMZ. Mr. Soong, tear down this wall. Where, where were you in North Korea? Anybody else? Speaker, speaker gets the last word. Well, thank you. Um, I'll try to make it short. Uh, first, we call North Korea communists. They don't say that about themselves. They don't call their party the Communist Party. They call it the Workers' Party of Korea. They don't call themselves communists. That's something that is peculiar to this country. I think uh, if you people read books like this one or this one, they'll see that Stalin did not instigate the Korean War. And this guy is not in any way any apologist for Kim Il-sung or North Korea. I didn't mention some things that, I, that were in those things that I wrote, and I guess I should have in hindsight. The most important is that the U.S. has had military maneuvers against uh, North Korea every year for, I don't know, 20, 30 years. And there were always military maneuvers as a preparing the soldiers for a war of deterrence against an attack by the North. Until this year, they changed in their nature and they became war maneuvers for a preemptive attack upon North Korea. 
this is the first time the U.S. has had those kind of war maneuvers as a preemptive attack on North Korea using nuclear weapons, nuclear bombs. We don't hear that here. We just hear how North Korea reacted so violently or so, out, uh, so loudly. But that is why they did because the U.S. was conducting preemptive war maneuvers against their country using nuclear bombs. That's what lay behind everything that's happened in the last month. Uh, my interest in, in writing those things was to inform people here about the opinion of the people in North Korea and how they look at things. And I don't think we can really make a very educated judgment of, of the kind of system they have until we understand how they think and how they look at things. For example, we live in a one-party state right here in Chicago, but <laughs> yes. is this, uh, are we suffering from democracy, lack of democracy in this city, like any more than, say, Milwaukee or something? We don't think of that. We had a father and a son as rulers for like 50 years. Why is a one-party system with a father and son running this place for 50 years? Why is that so different from North Korea? It's the same. Good question. But we don't think of it as the same. So why don't we think of it as the same? Brainwash, we do. Obviously, we you know we think we got some freedoms here in Chicago. So obviously, they must probably think they have some freedoms there. We just don't think they do. Or probably people in some other place in the world think people in Chicago really must suffer under this family dictatorship in this one-party system. That's true. That's true. Right? But we don't think like that. We're just programmed. No, we don't. It happens over there. It doesn't happen here. Um, I think that's the only thing I'd like to say is that I don't think we can judge about how their system is and how their people feel unless we really understand it from their in their own point of view, and why in their own funny? terms. I mean, I am not comfortable living in that country, but I'm sure a lot of those people in that country are quite comfortable living in that country. And I don't really think it's our business as our country to be telling them, well, we don't feel you should be comfortable, so we're going to do something about it. We don't really care if you like it or not. That's not our business. We should just leave them alone. And then that's all I'm really interested in. And sometimes it's very uh, educational to sit down and listen to somebody with a point of view that you don't like their point of view, but you have to respect, you know, I don't believe what you believe, but I see you do, and I can respect your opinion, and you have a right to your opinion, but I don't agree with it. I mean, I have that with a lot of people. Like, there's a lot of very religious people who, I don't, I'm not religious, but I can respect their religious views and how they lead their lives. And it's, I don't think I need to go change it for them to suit my particular beliefs. I should leave them alone. And that's what I think we should do with Korea. So that's all I would have to say. Thank you for attending the college, and that's a wrap. <laughs>